What about the idea that the Cold War served certain ideological and political purposes for the U.S., and now the U.S. is seeking a new paradigm? There's something true about the fact that the Cold War paradigm was extremely useful as a way of controlling people. So like say, take the labor movement. You know, one of the ways of controlling, undermining, and destroying the labor movement was weeding out the activist elements on the principle that they're somehow not uh, loyal enough to the state at this time of, uh, you know, when the enemy is at our throats. Well, like any propaganda, even the most vulgar propaganda that comes out of Stalinist Russia, there's always some thread of truth to it. You just couldn't have propaganda that doesn't have some, you know, marginal element of truth. And there was some marginal element of truth here too, but it wasn't very real. It's like the Cuba case, you know. So yes, this has been a very terrific hammer to use over people's heads. And it was understood, I should say. If you haven't read it yet, you should read NSC 68, which was, everybody agrees, was the fundamental Cold War document. Uh, it's kind of interesting that its content, everybody recognizes it as the major document, but nobody quotes it, uh, with very few exceptions, I'm one. Uh, but I have a book called Deterring Democracy, which in the first chapter has a lot of extensive quotes from NSC 68. Uh, it's um, April 1950, and it sort of laid out the basic picture of the Cold War, and it's quite fascinating to read. For one thing, because when you, you can see why diplomatic historians don't quote it. This was written by the real hotshots, you know, Dean Acheson, Paul Nitze, all these smart guys. It reads like a bunch of raving lunatics, you know? I mean, don't take my word for it, read it, you know? I mean, I concede I picked out the most uh, dramatic <laughs> examples, but read the whole thing if you feel like it's not that long. Uh, in my view, it sounds like a bunch of raving lunatics, which is why nobody ever cites it. But they do make some points. I mean, the, the picture they tell is kind of like a fairy tale. You know, on one hand, there's absolute evil. That's the other side. It's kind of like a fairy tale. You'd be embarrassed to read your grandchildren. There's this total absolute evil, you know, the Kremlin, this and that, which is planning to destroy the whole world and everything that ever existed and so on. On the other side, there's utter perfection. That's us. You know, we're like super angels. The only thing we ever do is uh, you work, you know, slave for the benefit of this and that. And it's portrayed in the picture of a, you know, a, a, an exaggerated, fa a parody of a fairy tale. There's never any evidence given because it's just like a matter of definition. They say it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an essential nature of the Kremlin that it acts this way. So you don't have to even give evidence because it's just part of their nature. And it's a central property of our nature that we do this sort of thing, okay? So there's no evidence given. In fact, there is evidence scattered around, very carefully scattered around so that anybody who's gonna look for it is gonna have a hard time finding it. And when you, find, when you do put together the evidence I did in the same book, you find that it completely undermines whatever thesis they have about relative power. But forgetting that, then comes the proposals. The proposals are we're involved in a real war. It's a real war you know, the Cold War. We have to fight it like a war to prevent this monstrous thing from destroying everything and allowing utter perfection and magnificence to win. Uh, and in a war, you've got to have things like just suppression. We have to have suppression of dissent among us. One of our weaknesses is that we're too tolerant and too open and too free. They say that, you know, and that's a weakness. So we have to have just suppression and control of dissent and you know, make sure that everybody's obedient and so on. And the way to do it is through, they also call for military Keynesianism. That means uh, transferring public funds to private industry, which was a big issue then, because everybody knew that the economic system is not gonna function without a tremendous amount of public funding, state funding poured in, so that was crucial. And that's true of the international economy too at that time, uh, very heavily reliant on military spending to revitalize it. Uh, the, and they know all that, and it's laid out, uh, but also uh, that it would be an ideological weapon. It would be a weapon to control people. And that's true, it was. I mean, from then until the game started to go away in 1989, around then, uh, it was a tremendous weapon of flood control. Anything you wanted to block, just yell, or do, you know, yell Cold War. It didn't matter how crazy it was. Sometimes there was some truth to it, sometimes not. So yes, you need a new paradigm, okay? Because how are we gonna beat people over the head now that we don't have that around anymore? And if you look through the 80s, it was already obvious through the 1980s that this stuff is gonna lose its efficacy. 
you'd have to be a big genius to figure out that the Soviet Union was in trouble. So you look at stuff, say, I was writing since the early 80s, I've been saying, look, they're going to have to go to something else. And in fact, right through the 80s, there's an almost desperate search for something else. You know, international terrorism or crazed Arabs or Hispanic narco-traffickers or something or other that we have to defend ourselves against. Or otherwise, how are you going to control everybody? Okay, domestic crime, mostly manufactured. You know, U.S. doesn't have crime levels very different from other industrial countries. Uh, it doesn't, in fact but has a very different perception of crime. Uh, welfare queens, you know, sort of by implication black, uh, driving around in Cadillacs and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so there's all sorts of effort to, you know, manufacture enemies for people to hate, uh, but a foreign enemy is much better. Uh, and uh, so here's where the science of government comes in. Now, let's get back to this clash of civilizations thing. Uh, Huntington's... Uh, you know, everybody is flailing around for some paradigm, you know, some big thing that you can use to control people. And Huntington's idea was clash of civilizations. So, you know, there's Islam and us and all these other things. And the reason why the world, the idea is the reason why the world is so disorderly is because you've got all, you know, with the Cold War going, you've got all these uh, ethnic groups killing each other and so on. Well, as usual, it's always a good idea to start by asking about the facts. Whenever you hear anything said very confidently, the first thing that should come to mind is, wait a minute, is that true? You know? So is it true? I mean, is it true that there's more ethnic conflict now than there was 20 years ago? Well, take a look. Uh, in most of the big conflicts that are going on around the world are, were going on right through the Cold War, like Burundi and Rwanda. There were huge massacres going on in the early 70s. Actually, I wrote about them at the time. Nobody was talking about them because it wasn't interesting. But they were there. Uh, there are some, the, in fact, or take, say, you know, in fact, just about every one you pick goes way back. Now, there are some that are new. Those in, within the former Soviet system, including Yugoslavia. You know, within the old so-called communist system, yeah, they're new. So like the war in Chechnya or, you know, Azerbaijan, Armenia, you know, Tajikistan, you know, these things are all new. But that's standard. Any time a tyrannical system breaks down, you have all sorts of conflict internal to it. Just take a look at the breakdown of the European empires. Every single one was like that, and most of them were worse. Uh, so first of all, the, the, very, the factual basis is very thin. Uh, now what about the uh, principle, clash of civilizations? Like, say, the big bad guy is Islam. Well, there are a few problems with that. Uh, our, the most fundamentalist Islamic state in the world is our big ally, Saudi Arabia. How does that fit? You know? I mean, Saudi Arabia is a real... Uh, it's not fundamentalist enough for some of the people in it, but uh, it's pretty extreme. Uh, are we trying to undermine Saudi Arabia? Of course not. They're sitting on all the oil. You know? In fact, they're our clients. That's a family dictatorship that we keep in power because they make sure that the money from oil doesn't go to the people of the region but goes to London and New York. So they're okay. There's no clash of civilizations there. Uh, that's state fundamental. What about individual, you know, like non-state? Well, by far the worst ones are the guys who are tearing Afghanistan to pieces. Uh, you find cra more crazy Islamic fundamentalists around than them. I don't know about them. Where'd they get their power from? Well, you know, your pocket, you know. Uh, they got $6 billion or so, it's claimed, from the United States and Saudi Arabia uh, through the 1980s. Now they're tearing Afghanistan apart, but it's not our, you know, nothing that we did. You know, we're only wonderful people. Uh, so how, where is this clash of civilizations between Islam and the West? I don't see it. I mean, Indonesia is an Islamic state. Do you see us trying to undermine Indonesia? I mean, in a lot of rotten things in Indonesia, like, for example, wages are about half the level of China, which is not so munificent. Do you see us doing anything about that? I mean, I, I think this is all farce. You know? I mean, I don't mean to say total farce. Like, there must be a new paradigm, you know, something that people can build their careers on and write books about and so on and so forth, which can then be turned into a device of controlling people. That part is true. Uh, and maybe this will work, or if it doesn't, you try something else. <laughs>